welcome to 4550 RPM, celebrating the lives of past musos born in the 40s and the 50s. I'm your host GK, yes it's a pseudonym, and this is episode 4 and we're going to offer a brief overview of the life of John Lord, a legendary muso who shone in both the rock and classical world. Before we get into that, I just want to explain the raison d'etoire, raison d'etoire, or as I heard it once pronounced on an American movie, Raisin Data, for this show. I started a long-form podcast program called Philosopher Rock, which you can find on this channel. Please like and subscribe. We need you to do that so we can get some traction for the show. So we got Philosopher Rock underway, and I realise there are so many musos from the classic rock and associated era who are passing away, and I wanted to do something short and sharp that would in some way honour their memory and the contribution they made to popular music. Hence, 4550 RPM. I have a long list of artists I would like to cover, and I plan to get to most of them. My biggest impediment is actually my own health. Now, please, if you like what I'm doing, and you like what I'm offering, like, subscribe, and comment on this channel. I don't ask for anything else. Right, now to this episode. Born John Douglas Lord on the 9th of June 1941 in Leicester, UK, Lord studied classic music and played piano from the age of six. When he left school, he became a solicitor's clerk. Yep, that's how we say it here down under and I guess also in the UK. I think you Americans might say clerk. I'm not sure. Uh, and anyway, and early on he had an interest in theatre. Bach was a major influence on his life. For example, his tune, Bark Onto This, from his 1982 album, Before I Forget, is an example of his interest in Bach, and we'll speak more on that later. In 1963, he got hold of his first electric organ and joined Red Blood and his Blue Scissions before playing keyboards with the Artwoods, uh, led by Ronnie Wood's brother, Art. So all these people start to connect very early on, you can hear it here. During this period, he was a sought-after session muso, even apparently having played on the Kinks You Really Got Me release in 1964. Um, now, the band I was in covered this song, and I regard it as the very first heavy metal song of all time. I'm sure many of you will disagree. Now, whether you disagree or otherwise, let me know in the comments below. I wouldn't mind hearing if you've got a better alternative to the Kinks You Really Got Me for the first heavy metal song ever released. Anyway, in 1968, he formed Deep Purple with Richie Blackmore, who along with Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath were the pioneers of hard rock and heavy metal. Lord's time with Deep Purple is what he's most widely known for. Now, much has been written about Deep Purple and their roots, so I won't spend much time on that here. And just let me make a pertinent point here. I have found, after publishing episodes of 4550, I'm often asked, why did I leave this item out, or why didn't it include his time with so-and-so? And to be honest, it's not within the scope of this show to go so deep. That's what Philosopher Rock episodes are for. You can find them on this channel. Some of those shows are two and a half hours long, so if you like deep and heavy, go to Philosopher Rock. You can start with episode one, uh, where we covered Ronnie James Dio. Having said that, feel free to comment and share what you know on the artists I cover. Some of you have amazing stories to share. I'm really blown away by some of the stuff um, I read on the um, Cozy Powell episode that I did. Um, some of your comments there just blew me away. So um, feel free to comment anyway. Okay, let's get back on track again. I seem to be doing that a fair bit here, don't I? Um, okay, so some of the info included in this episode of 4550 RPM comes from the John Lord website. I'm going to put a link to that below and a link to any major um, sources that I use. I always like to offer a reference to that um, so that people don't think, you know, I'm plagiarizing or whatever. And if I offer a direct quote, I'll let you know. It was in the early years of Deep Purple that Lord's trademark sound was crafted. His main instrument was the Hammond C3, and he put the organs through a Marshall amp. This was during the time when Moog and other synthesizers were emerging, and his sound definitely differed from many of his contemporary keys players. Now, I have to say personally, I love the rich sound of the Hammond coupled with the Leslie cabinet, and I thought the B3 was the Hammond of choice of keys players from that era. Um, does anyone know the difference between a B3 or a C3? Let me know. I don't know if it's got something to do with logistics. 
is it the weight? Like, is it for transportation purposes? I don't know. But um, anyway, apparently in 1973, uh, his initial Hammond organ wore out and he bought another one from Christine McVie of Fleetwood Mac, who sadly passed away recently. And um, she's on my 4550 RPM list as well. Lord's Hammond sound combined with Blackmore's guitar made for a somewhat unique sound. There are so many examples of that that you could find. Um, but for a very early take on this, go to Deep Purple's first album and have a listen to the intro to Hush. Um, and while you're there, don't forget to listen to the solo on that song. Um, or try Purple's 1970 album and listen to Child in Time. Uh, this tune is part of a set list that they... Uh, played in the early 70s and in their late later 80s reunion tours. Um, a special mention here for the instrumental Ring That Neck from their 68-69 release, um, The Book of Taliesin. I get why many of you won't dig it, but I have always had a soft spot for that track. And um, to be honest, I'm not that much into instrumentals, but Ring That Neck sort of resonates with me for some reason. Now, fans will know that Lord's work included much more than rock music. Now, let me share this from his website, and the link is below. And, quote, During Deep Purple's early years, John wrote several large-scale works for orchestra and rock group, including Concerto for Group and Orchestra, which was premiered, filmed, and recorded live at the Royal Albert Hall with Deep Purple and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Sir Malcolm Arnold in September of 1969. Gemini Suite is a 1970 commission from the BBC, which was recorded with the London Symphonic Orchestra, again conducted by Arnold, and Windows is a 1974 project co-written with conductor Eberhard Schoener for the pre... Oh, wow, how about this? For the pre Junessa in Munich and broadcast live by several European TV stations. 1975 Sarabanda, recorded with the Philharmonia Hungarica, conducted by Eberhard Schoener, with Andy Summers from The Police on Guitar, became one of John's most celebrated works with its eastern tinged and melodic rhythms. Unquote. So you see, Lord had skills in both the rock and classical world. Indeed, on a few tracks, those skills are combined. His work with Deep Purple encompassed a number of studio and live albums, including a favourite of mine, Made in Japan, recorded there during their first tour in 1972. As I said earlier, I won't be going too deep on Purple, but did you know that in 1975 they were declared the loudest band in the world? Now this resonates with me a little bit, as I played on the same stage as the loudest band in Australia at the time, when my band opened for Midnight Oil. Now they didn't let us have all their gear, you know, they they only give us probably 10% of what was available, but it's a great story that I can tell my grandkids. Now I'm sure we all know that when Deep Purple broke up in 1976, everyone went on to successful subsequent groups like Rainbow and Whitesnake. But before that, John Lord formed the short-lived group Pace, Ashton and Lord with former Purple drummer Ian Pace and vocalist Tony Ashton, guitarist Bernie Marsden, who, who would also go on to White Snake, and bassist Paul Martinez. If we could see a family tree of the great bands from this era, it would be an amazing thing to see how much crossover between them all um, there was between all the bands of that era, but that's a project for someone else. It's, it's well beyond me. Um, but anyway, Pace, Ashton and Lord produced one studio album, Malice in Wonderland, and there's a couple of live issues as well. Pace, Ashton and Lord disbanded after a couple of years, with everyone going on to other projects. Okay, so now let's suspend chronological order for a minute and do a flashback or two here. This band was not the first time Ashton and Lord had worked together. We can flash back to 1974's first of the Big Bands album, which included among others, Peter Frampton, Ian Pace and Cozy Powell, to name just a few. If you haven't caught it yet, check out my 4550 RPM story on Powell. You can find that on this channel. Okay, also in 1974, Lord recorded a live album, Windows, which was a mix of prog rock and orchestral music with the assistance of David Coverdale, Tony Ashton, Glenn Hughes and the Munich Chamber Opera Orchestra, conducted by Eberhard Schoener, as I mentioned earlier in that quote. 
Now, all these connections read like a who's who of the rock and prog rock era um, of that time. So please feel free to comment on anything significant that I might have missed as I can't cover it all in such a short video. I mean, really, there is so much to Lord's career, you could spend hours talking about it. So feel free to comment, but please don't complain. Let's move on. In 1978, Lord joined Whitesnake. Now, fans and aficionados will know that after David Coverdale left Deep Purple, he released a solo album entitled Whitesnake. A couple of years later, he put together a band, and that band was ultimately called Whitesnake. Lord joined Whitesnake and rounded out their sound with his keys, which included his use of the Hammond organ and also, I believe, electric piano and Moog synthesizers. Let me read something for you. I'll put the link below and I quote, Lord's job in Whitesnake was largely limited to adding colour or, in his own words, a halo to round out a blues rock sound that already accompanied two lead guitarists, Bernie Marsden and Mickey Moody. He added a Yamaha CP70 electric piano to his setup and finally a huge bank of synthesizers on stage courtesy of Moog, uh, Mini Moog Opus Poly Moog, so he could play the 12 bar blues the band often required and recreate string section and other effects. Such varied work is evident on tracks like Here I Go Again, Wine, Women and Song, She's a Woman and Till the Day I Die. A number of singles entered the UK charts, taking the now 30-something Lord onto Top of the Pops, with regularity between 1980 and 1983. He later expressed frustration that he was a poorly paid hired hand, but fans saw little of this discord and Whitesnake's commercial success kept him at the forefront of readers' polls as Heavy Rock's foremost keyboard maestro. His dissatisfaction and Coverdale's eagerness to revamp the band's lineup and lower the average age to help crack the US market smoothed the way for the reformation of Deep Purple Mark II in 1984. Unquote. So what do you guys think about um, the re reformation of Deep Purple uh, in 1984? This comment here, is that fair comment as to how it came about? What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. It's one of those things that I often ask, how did they go from, you know, from this to that? Because, you know, I don't have all the answers um, and maybe some of you guys know. All right. So while he was with White Snake, Lord recorded a couple of solo albums. Let me quote again and, of course, see the links below for the sources. During his tenure in White Snake, Lord had the opportunity to record two distinctly dif different solo albums. 1982's Before I Forget featured a largely conventional eight-song lineup, no orchestra, and with the bulk of the songs being either mainstream rock tracks, uh, Holly, Hollywood rock and roll and Chance on a Feeling, or specifically on side two, a series of very English classical piano ballads sung by the mother and daughter duo Vicky Brown and Sam Brown, wife and daughter of entertainer Joe Brown, and vocalist Elma Gantry, as well as piano and synthesizer instrumentals such as Burnt Wood, named after Lord's stately Oxfordshire home at the time. The album also boasted the cream of British rock talent, including the session drummer Simon Phillips, Cozy Powell, Neil Murray, Simon Kirk, Boz Burrell, and Mick Ralphs. So some people there from Bad Company, you can see that there. Unquote. Yeah, so I chucked in the comment about Bad Company. Unquote. Okay, so John Lord joined the newly formed Deep Purple Mark II reunion in 1984, along with Ian Pace, Richie Blackmore, Ian Gillen, and Roger Glover. The Mark II version of Deep Purple being my favourite, and I know I'm not alone in that opinion. Lord was a busy bloke, and he was high in demand as a muso to play on your album. For example, he played on Cosy Powell's Octopus, Dave Gilmore's About Face, and Alvin Lee's Detroit Diesel, to name just a few. Let me know in the comments if there's other significant ones that I've not included that he's played on, because I wouldn't mind having a look at those if you've got some good suggestions. Uh, this this episode's going on a bit long, I can tell already. This is going to be one of the longest, and I don't want them to be this long, so I'm going to jump ahead. You guys fill out in the comments some of this inter uh, vening period here, because I've got to jump ahead um, to 1997. Lord released a deeply personal album, uh, Picture Within, inspired by the loss of his parents. And it deals with feelings of loss that we all must face, especially as we age and we see loved ones near and far. 
uh, die. And by that I mean our own family and friends and some of these musos that we never met, so they're far away, but somehow we grieve their loss. Jumping ahead some more, I've really got to jump ahead here, guys. Um, jumping ahead some more, uh, Lord left Deep Purple in 2002. So he retired from Deep Purple amicably, amicably after their UK tour in February 2002. He said that leaving Purple was just as traumatic as I'd always suspected it would be, and more so, if you see what I mean, unquote. Okay, a special mention here before I move on about the Hoochie Coochie Men, because there's a bit of a Aussie connection here. Uh, before we finish up, let me mention this. The Hoochie Coochie Men, an Australian blues rock group put together by Bob Daisley and Tim Gaze that, that featured John Lord. The group featured uh, a few guest members, including Ian Gillen, Australia's Jimmy Barnes and Jeff Duff. Lord features on the 2003 release Live at the Basement and 2007's Danger, White Men Dancing. Now, if you haven't come across those yet, they're worth a listen. So Hoochie Coochie Men, um, Live at the Basement and Danger, White Men Dancing. Now, at the risk of repeating myself, and I know I have, I've got to leave out so much. I mean, Lord was just so prolific. This is not going to do him um, uh, what he is due. Uh, but it is beyond the scope of the show for me to go so deep. But his work in the rock and classical fields is prolific, as I said. Let me give you a couple of examples, and these are from the website uh, referenced below. Quote, John continued to perform all over the world with various orchestras and with vocalists Steve Balsamo and Cassia Lasker. Between 2008 and 2011, John performed at arts festivals as diverse as Litchfield and Shipley in the UK, to Plovdiv in Bulgaria and the Varada Cultural Festival in Brazil. His concert schedule included three nights in Adelaide, Australia, numerous concerts in Germany, two tours of Russia, several concerts at Trondheim's Nidaris Cathedral in Norway, and visits to Korea, Switzerland, Poland, among others. He also find, found time to play with Nigel Kennedy, Ian Anderson and Rick Wakeman and record with Anna Phoebe, Steve Balsamo and Cassie Alaska. In 2011, while John was putting together a definitive studio recording of his iconic concerto for group and orchestra, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and stopped touring. His last concerts were the Sunflower Jam on 8 July 2011 and a performance of To Notice Such Things at the Shipley Arts Festival two days later. On May 15, 2012, as part of a year-long celebration of John's classical work, John's From Darkness to Light for Choir and Orchestra was performed by the Hagen Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Florian Ludwig and broadcast live by German WDR Radio. Happily, John got to hear both the first ever brought radio broadcast of From Darkness to Light and the finished studio recording of his cherished concerto before he passed away. After treatment in both England and in Israel, John Lord died on the 16th of July 2012 at the London Clinic following a pulmonary embolism. His interment was at the new churchyard of St Mary the Virgin Church in Hambledon. In 2016, John Lord was inducted with Deep Purple into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This episode is dedicated to his memory, John Lord, 9 June 1941 to 16 July 2012. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget, like, subscribe and comment. Please join in the conversation. Let me know stuff I've missed. Be polite. Some people can be a bit snarky about things. Why didn't you say this or whatever? But please join in. Let's have a bit of a discussion. Um, very important person in the um, from this era of rock music. And uh, check back for more episodes as soon as I can get them out. Uh, I think I've said before... Um, my health is limiting me. I did want to do much more, um, but I, I had, I've had to have a bit of a slow down and take it a bit easy. But anyway, check out the other episodes on this channel. If you like long form stuff, we've got some that last for two and a half hours, or if you like the shorter stuff, 45, 50 RPM. I don't ask for anything but a like, a subscribe, a comment. And if you want to go the next step, share it with somebody. Thanks for your time. I'm your host, GK. Have a good one.